Welcome everyone to the L7C podcast. And today we have a very special guest with us today. We have the wonderful Chelsea Police. How are you doing today, ma'am? I'm good. Happy to be here. Now, Chelsea, you are the first female guest on the L7C. It is a huge honor for us to actually get your free time because I know you don't have that much free time. For the listeners at home, why don't you give a little introduction rundown on who you are and what you're doing? So I am a PhD student at the University of Louisville. I study sport administration. Um, Currently, my interest area is youth sport, um, focusing specifically on youth soccer. So I enjoy looking at the development system in the United States specifically. Currently working on my dissertation. So by the end of this year, I should have my doctorate, which is really exciting. Always have loved sport and to be able to find a way to make a career out of it has been really special. So at the end of the year, you will be doctor police. That's the goal. Yes. I think we will achieve that goal. Hopefully, you know, and then when you come back, you'll be like, I'm doctor police now. So Chelsea alluded to it. She loves sports. You've been involved in sports most of your life. Yeah. So I played multiple sports as a kid. I played soccer. I played basketball, played softball, ran track, but my my true love has always been soccer. Once I got to high school, um, I ran track for a year, but focused primarily on soccer. Um, My last three years of high school, played some travel ball, always played indoor, things like that. I just I just love soccer so much that it, it became a huge part of my life. Did you play in college? I did not. I looked to play Division three here in the United States, but Just didn't work out in terms of money, things like that. So um, I went to Ball State, studied um, actuarial science there, uh, played intramurals when I could, and then um, tried to shift my focus from my math major to combining that with sport. And that's kind of how I got to where I am today, studied sport administration as a master's student, and then continued my education to where I am as a PhD student currently. And now with you getting your PhD, do you have time to play like rec league soccer or all that stuff? Yes. Uh, yeah, we actually, a group of the graduate assistants at Louisville played in a league last year. We are the reigning co-ed champs of that wow. league. Big deal. Wanted to play this year. Unfortunately, COVID has created some difficulties with that. So not playing currently, but hopefully in the spring we'll have an opportunity to defend our title and and show the world that we are stellar soccer players show the world wow i thought we went from intramural show the world hey it's a big deal oh i'm I'm not doubting you so today we are actually going to talk about something that's a very big deal we're going to be talking about women in sports and we're going to cover a lot of things about women in sports pay gap exposure uh disrespect people being left out of conversations because they're women so we're gonna knock all of those things and talk about all those topics and the first one obviously is going to be the pay gap you are a huge fan of the u.s women national soccer team and they have won the world cup the past two three years they've won two in a row four overall and they get paid significantly less than the men who have not even made it They didn't even make the World Cup last year, last World Cup. When you see that the women, and they've been fighting for this for a while, and it looks like it gets traction, then it doesn't, then it keeps going in a circle. What are you thinking about when the women are trying to fight for equal pay? For me, I think it comes down to the players want to see what they've cultivated being better for the next generation. So we think about the 99ers, um, that age group or that um, group of women in particular, that's who I grew up watching. So Mia Hamm, Julie Foudy, Brandi Chastain, those players. And what's unique about them is they, they had been together for a long time. In that 99 World Cup, 
they took a major stand um, against the Federation. They basically came in and said, if we don't get better benefits, pay, things like that for being a part of this organization, we're not going to go. The U.S. Federation said, okay, we'll find the next set of women to go. They'll replace you. We'll take the U16s, U18s, whatever group of women are willing to go. All of those women fell in behind this group of women and said, absolutely not. We will not go. Um, And that's a huge deal because the ability to represent your country is a huge honor. And for all of those women to say, no, we're taking the stand and we're going to make it so that the Federation has to make a tough decision and pay us what we deserve. Give us what we deserve for the work that we're putting in. That's huge. And what that did is that set the next generation up that created opportunities for them. And I think with this particular World Cup team from 2019, that's really all they hope for. There's some things that should be said about the pay gap in particular. The problem is the men and the women have two separate CBAs. And so their pay structures are a result of those two different CBAs. Um, And so Unfortunately, the women are tied to that. They get paid a salary. Mm-hmm. The men get paid based on the games that they play. So the men, um, whether they win or lose, get paid. The women, it's a little bit different, and that's not the case. So uh, the top players get paid a salary, so they get paid regardless. Mm-hmm. And so that's part of the problem. And so those different CBAs kind of create an issue in terms of what is equal. What is equal pay in the in the world of men's soccer? And part of that is the women play way more games, particularly because they went to the World Cup. They play a lot more friendlies than the men. So if we're thinking about comparing the two, if they're doing the same thing every single year, if they play the same number of games, absolutely they should pay, be paid the same. Mm-hmm. Um, but their collective bargaining agreements create make that really difficult right now. So that's part of the whole legal battle that's that's in play right now. Just sticking with the boys and the girls soccer, I know one of the arguments that people bring up is endorsements and TV revenue and things like that if they're saying this is why men should be getting it paid more than women, but just sticking to the soccer I do recall women's soccer, the World Cup brings in more viewers and there's more endorsements and commercials on that during the games because more people are watching them than the men. Is that right? Yeah. So the the most recent World Cup, the Women's World Cup, the set record viewership numbers for the final, particularly and be out the men's World Cup final as well. So that shows you that people want to watch women's sport. And that's, I see in any sport really is the argument that nobody cares about women's sports. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares about watching U.S. women's national team play in a friendly. And that's honestly, that's false. There are a lot of people who care about it, but the problem really stems from people don't care enough to put in the work to make it so that it is available to everybody to watch. Mm -hmm. I equate this kind of to like men's sports. They're on third base. You know, people have seen them for years and years and years. People love men's sports and women's sports are on first base. And so you you expect popularity or people have this expectation that popularity of the sports should be exactly the same to receive um, pay, same pay, same funding, things like that. But when you're starting on first base, you don't have the resources or the ability to meet those expectations. So you're being set up to fail from the beginning. And so when people use that argument that people don't care, I get really frustrated because that's not the case. It's just women have not been given the same opportunities that men have. If the WNBA had started at the exact same time that the NBA started, it would probably be significantly different than what it is today in terms of viewership and resources and the salaries that they receive. But because they started so much later and the funding's not there, it makes it so much harder. And then people equate that to they just don't care. I want to go off of the opportunities because I think the biggest thing that affects the women and men pay gap and just their equality in sports is the media coverage. I think that the media really plays a big role 
in that just for example a show like espn first take which is probably the biggest hot take debate show in sports right now they could they would debate for 20 minutes on about if Kyrie Irving had a slight to LeBron James, but if the women were playing or Simone Bias did something, that wouldn't even make the ticket. So I think that definitely the media needs to really step their game up on that end because the only time you hear the media come in is when they're like, oh, the women are going on strike because they want to be paid more. They cover it for a couple of days and then it's gone. So what do you think about the media's role in this women in sports and the gap between them and the men? Yeah, so truly, women receive about 4% of media coverage in the United States. And that's incredible to me. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous in my opinion. We saw the NWSL Challenge Cup this summer broke records in terms of viewership. The WNBA this summer has broken records in terms of viewership. So I don't, I truly don't understand why networks like ESPN don't want to cover women's sports and they only cover women's sports when bad things happen. And that's really, really unfortunate because there's a lot of good things that are happening in women's sports. We've seen, you know, the game grow in soccer significantly over the last decade. Um, We've seen it grow even in the United States, which is huge. People, you know, in the past said that nobody would ever watch soccer. And and there's been this significant shift in in people watching soccer. So the fact that women only receive 4% of media coverage is is unbelievable. And if you watch like ESPN, for instance, you oftentimes, you know, they advertise things that are going on, you know, um, games that are happening a couple of days later, later in the evening. And you'll see during a women's sport, so say we're watching a women's college basketball game, you'll see a men's sport advertised in the middle of it. But when you when you watch a men's sport, it's highly unlikely that you're going to see a women's sport advertised in the same way that men's sports are. But what we've seen, especially with COVID and, you know, sports being ripped away from us, so to speak, and then suddenly brought back. The NWSL was the first American sport to be back. Most people think it's the MLB because ESPN didn't cover that. Major networks didn't cover the fact that the NWSL had had returned. And so it's just this cyclical thing like, you know, and and the NWSL again had record numbers. And so I don't if you market and you let people know that these events are happening, these are going to be on TV, people are going to watch them. So if I'm an ESPN exec, I'm watching those numbers. I'm seeing those viewership numbers and saying, okay, there's clearly something there. People are interested, but how do we continue to bring them back and to continue to engage them so that women's sports continue to grow? And so I think from a media perspective, it needs to be covered and it needs to be done so in a way that covers it in a in a positive light when positive things happen. Going off that media coverage, just obviously the people who've listened to the podcast before and like my wrestling ones, they know I'm a huge wrestling fan. And in wrestling, they have the thing of building up stars. So in terms of like women in sports in general, I feel like the last star that ESPN was super invested in women wise was Ronda Rousey. Because when she was in the MMA and she was champion and she was doing her stuff in the media, she was on every two seconds. They promoted her, things of that nature. And then when she lost first time to Holly Holm, there was like a whole week saying, oh, what was Rhonda? She's talking about suicide, things like that. And then when she lost again and she disappeared, you don't even hear ESPN talking about the current women in MMA, like Amanda Nunes, obviously Holly Holm. So they just stopped with that. Is there a st- I don't think there's a star problem with women who are in sports. Obviously, Serena Williams, uh, Simone Baez, Megan Rapino, like all of them. I mean, I think I know more women on the soccer team than I do the men's team. So I just I don't understand why the machine is not behind these marketable names. Usually I wish I could answer that question for you because I I don't know. 
it's tough thinking about that from my own perspective, just being a fan and, and being someone who works in sport or is associated with the industry. Because it's tough being a woman in sport. It's not easy. And, and we've seen some of the issues that women in sport have faced. For instance, Maria Taylor had a pretty rough mm-hmm. week um, not that long ago with the whole NBA ballot thing, leaving um, Anthony Davis off of all NBA teams and people coming for for that, asking why she even had a vote to begin with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she stuck up for herself, said, I, I played basketball, I've covered the NBA, and, and rightfully so. In addition to that, the whatever radio an analyst calling her or calling her out for her outfit during Monday Night Football. And, and that's something that I don't think most people realize or most men realize how difficult it is to be a woman in sport. Thinking about Maria Taylor and, and the whole outfit debacle, like, we constantly have to think about outfits in a different way than men do. Um, we have to think about, do our pants, are they too tight? Um, is this shirt too revealing? Is this appropriate? Are people going to think we're too sexy? Things like that. And it's, it's really unfair when men can put on khakis and a polo and nobody will question what it is they're wearing or say that they don't belong in, in this industry because they are they are a woman and so that's really difficult and i think that just sort of exacerbates what's what's happening in this women in sport sort of issues and and other things like that and then to go off the maria taylor thing it was doug gottlieb from fox who was the one asking how she got a vote if she's doing stuff like that and it was a broadcaster from chicago who said maria taylor looked like she was dressing up for the adult American video awards yes. then for Monday Night Football. And I guess to go off with the dressing thing, I don't I don't even think there's a win win in that situation, because if a woman dresses in a way that's deemed too sexy and then you have people like that coming for her. But then also on the flip side, if you have a woman who's dressed and is deemed not sexy or prude or whatever you want to call it then you have people coming like she looks up tight and so there's not really a win for that in those type of things and that one you just have to change people's hearts and minds about that what i want to go from there too is just now with the women just not the ones who play but the ones who commentate like maria taylor um, lauren rutledge and all those women are there any high ranking like women officials on Fox or ESPN, NBC? Because I feel like that's where you can get some change going if there were some high ranking women up there. And if they are, are they known? Do people know who they are? I'll be honest, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't really pay attention to exec necessarily because, and I think that's part of the problem, is they're not the face of the organization. <laughs> And so it's easy for them to kind of fall behind whatever logo or or network that they work for. But absolutely, I think if there are those women in there, they need to be conscious of what's happening and how women are treated in the industry and and do whatever they can to make sure that women continue to fill those spaces that men do. You know, we've seen that women have started to break into men's professional sports you know, Becky Hammond. Mm-hmm. Um, we've seen Sarah Thomas in the NFL. There's a couple of NFL coaches. Um, last week was history making with an, a, a female coaches on both sides of the field, as well as an, a female official. So we're seeing women start to break into these roles, but is it enough? Probably not. And will we see, will we see a, a female head coach coaching a men's sport that remains to be seen. I think Becky Hammond will probably be the first one. If that happens, I think she's very, very close to be being able to do that. But I, you know, going back to your question and thinking about the exec, no, absolutely. I think that they play a massive role in this and how they market and how they choose to highlight women's sports is, is massive. And, and I'm sure that, if there are high-ranking execs in those positions, they probably had to work pretty hard to get to that point. 
And so they understand what it feels like to kind of have to break through that glass ceiling and be able to put themselves in that position. And I would hope that they would do their best to, to make that possible for other women. And if Becky is become, does become the first coach in a male sport, I just think there'd be an enormous amount of pressure on her because it's just the age old thing with not just women, but minority. Anytime you're a minority in something, if you're not one of the better ones, then you're, you ruin it for, unfortunately, you ruin it for all other women to potentially get a shot, all other minorities. So I feel like that's the thing that needs to be changed too, because you see other normal coaches who aren't as good and get fired time after time, get that job over a woman, get that job over a minority. And then when the minority or woman messes up on their first coaching thing, they're fired and then they're out of the league. So, yeah, I mean, there was an example of that sort of situation in Louisville. So Louisville just announced that they're going to have an NWSL team um, for the 2021 season. And, and they recently announced their head coach and, and people were really hopeful that they would hire a woman to fill that head coaching position. And that's not what happened. And the man that they picked had coached in the NWSL previously and had a pretty atrocious record. So people were pretty upset that that was the route that the team decided to go. And that's to your point about women have such high pressure and high standards when it comes to being in those roles, the leadership roles. So somebody, you know, a man could go you know, whatever a basketball record is. 1765. That's bad. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so yeah, go 17 and 65 and have a job the next year. If a woman did that, they would likely not have a job the next no. year. Or there's situations in college where a woman gets fired from their position and the next coach is a man to kind of clean up the mess. Um, because People just don't have the same confidence in women in those roles as they do men. And so absolutely, Becky would have a significant amount of pressure. A substantial, the standards would be outrageous for her, which is really, really unfortunate in, in that moment because we've seen what she can do. And, and having Pop as her mentor, that, that goes a long way. So it's kind of a lose-lose because you want to see women be in those positions, mm -hmm. but then are they going to be successful or are they going to be put in a position where they can be successful? So, you know, if a woman takes a head coaching position that's a professional men's sport, like what team do they have? Do they have the ability to build a team so that they can be successful or are they getting you know, D-level players who maybe aren't going to play for her or are going to have an issue with it and, and tank, and then suddenly management's going to be like, oh, this was a total disaster. And you're right, that's going to ruin it for, for anybody coming after her. So next I want to talk about greatest of all time conversations and how women get left out of that. And not just greatest of all times in their respective sports, just like best athlete of the past 21st uh, century. I've seen on like ESPN and Fox, obviously names they'll throw out like LeBron James, uh, Tom Brady. They'll even throw in people. Now they're throwing in Patrick Mahomes after his couple years. But when you think of Mount Rushmore's of sports, no matter who, whatever sport you want, people like Serena Williams, and you brought up yesterday when we were talking how we were building this podcast and Simone Baez get left out. And I just don't understand how those two get left out of those type of things when they're obviously the best at their sport ever and one of the best athletes ever. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. Like, I can't tell you the number of times I've been on Instagram or Twitter where something like GOAT has been posted and it's like LeBron James and somebody else. And, and you'll look in the comments and it'll be like Serena Williams or Simone Biles or any other woman you could possibly think of that has this great presence in the sport industry and people just don't care to think about them. And, and Serena is an incredible case of an athlete. She's been on the tour for probably 22 years now. She just turned 39, won her first grand slam at 17. 
that's unbelievable. The fact that she's still playing at 39, the fact that she's still playing after she had a daughter, the fact that she won a Grand Slam while being pregnant, that's not anything a man can do. So why are we not celebrating that? Simone Biles, on the other hand, she is 22 or 23 years old. She's won countless world championships. She's never been beaten in the all-around, or at least not in the last 10 years. And, and she's oftentimes left out of that. She has a ridiculous number of medals, more than anybody in gymnastics, and she is continually building new skills at 22 or 23, which is unheard of. Uh, in the gymnastics world she's going to try and go to the olympics again in 2021 should they happen so for them to just be left out of those conversations and for women in general to be left out of those conversations it's i don't really know why that's the case i mean i think it's because people don't care to think about women's sports because they just set them aside and think that they're not important but Think about who's in tennis now. Um, we've got Coco Gauff, and we've got Sloane Stevens, and um, a predominantly white sport is not so much anymore. And the only reason that is is because of Venus and Serena Williams. The only reason that the four Grand Slams have equal pay between the men and the women is because of the Williams sisters and Billie Jean King and some of those pioneer women who have been an absolute, I mean, have been absolutely phenomenal in the sport industry, have been incredible for women, have have opened doors for women, and we still, to this day, don't recognize that. On the Serena thing that you just said, that she started when she was 19 and she's 39 right now, and no one's ever been able to do what she's been doing, especially for her longevity and age. If you take out... I guess maybe Serena Williams, it's the same thing that is on ESPN every two seconds about LeBron James, how he's in year 17, 35 years old. No one's been able to do this this long for 17 years and at the age of 35. And you just said that Serena has been doing it for almost 20 years and age 39. And the caveat too also is that she had a child during all this and even won, I think, which tournament she won when she was pregnant. She won something when she was pregnant and she was pregnant during that. Obviously a man can't win a thing when they're pregnant. So that's just added thing. And that how that's not emphasized every day, even in the off seasons, that's just crazy. And then to go on the Simone thing, I think that how many medals does she have? I think it's 29 somewhere in there. And that's all of them. So that's like world championship Olympics. So probably the only person who probably has the same amount close to or more in the country, or probably the world right now, is Michael Phelps. Probably. And they, the gym, anyone who's in gymnastics is not talked about unless it's the Olympics. Like, I don't even think you can find a normal sports fan on the street. And it, like, hey, have you ever watched, like, the World Championships of gymnastics? They'll be like, I only thought they only do gymnastics during the Olympics. So, and the only time I think they were in the news recently was with the Larry Nassner and all that jazz. So how do we get more exposure to something like gymnastics that we've been dominant as a country and we'll get more people to care about like the regular season before we get to the Olympics? Well, first of all, we need to do something with that governing body. Um, the whole Larry Nassar scandal um, just is absolutely atrocious. Never should have happened. None of our Olympians should ever have experienced what they did if one adult had done what they were supposed to when somebody told them about what was going on. So number one, the governing body either needs to, I mean, they've cleaned house already once, but there's still issues associated with the the governing body. So something needs to happen with that, number one. Uh, Number two, I think because of the Larry Nassar scandal, people have maybe focused on gymnastics a little bit more and again that goes back to this issue of we only focus on women's sports when bad things are happening Mm -hmm. i also think that simone has actually really helped the gymnastics community Mm -hmm. because she has had such a voice um there have been instances where you know tweets from simone have 
created change in the gymnastics community. For instance, uh, one of the presidents that they hired lasted for a day or so because she made a comment about Colin Kaepernick and kneeling and whatever else. And Simone was like, it's not like we're looking for sponsors or anything. And so she resigned, was fired because of Simone's tweet. Simone has become very vocal. And I think that has kind of changed. People see her and they know her and why um, she is such a big athlete. And I think that's created some more visibility for gymnastics but the crazy thing about gymnastics is there's this whole other side than just elite gymnastics um and that's college gymnastics Mm -hmm. college gymnastics are so entertaining to watch it's so different from elite gymnastics i think that if universities that have gymnastics marketed those a little bit more i think that would shed the spotlight on gymnastics so much more It's actually really incredible to watch them. And you've had former Olympians that have gone and competed Mm -hmm. collegiately, particularly at uh, UCLA with Madison Kosha and Kyla Ross. And so people still recognize those names. They know those names because they've won gold medals. And so why are we not um, harnessing the fact that we have those Olympians? And actually UCLA's gymnastics social media is one of the top their engagement is through the roof so they've done something to be able to bring those eyes and ears into the gymnastics community and i think that's something that other universities should be doing as well to continue to grow the sport and make sure that it is being spotlighted for the right reason and you brought up uh smo and the con kaepernick type thing and usually the women are first to speak up about social issues, wearing shirts, even back with Trayvon Martin, I can't breathe, things like that. And then they don't get any publicity from it. But then as soon as like the men's sports start doing it, it's a topic on every station for the next couple of days. And the women are theoretically sacrificing more because they get paid significantly less and they don't have as many endorsements while the men, even if they get suspended for their teams because of different beliefs, they still have all their endorsements. And that that's something that I've noticed these past couple of years, how women are usually quick on the forefront, then they get screwed, then men hop on that forefront, and then they're always on TV. We 100% saw that this summer. Mm-hmm. So with COVID and, you know, racial injustice and, and the players wanting to make a difference, the WNBA players came out and said, hey, we want to wear Breonna Taylor's name on the back of our jerseys. We want to put Black Lives Matter on the court. And nobody talked about that. But then suddenly the NBA said the exact same things. And it was... A massive deal it was like the NBA was like oh yeah we'll totally do that you know we want to make sure that this is happening that we're we're you know doing what the players want because this is necessary this is needed we've seen Maya Moore she took off an entire season two seasons to Mm -hmm. fight for a man who was wrongfully convicted and was in prison and she got next to no media coverage for that she got more media coverage of the fact that she married that yes. guy than actually getting him out and and there have been other WNBA players in particular that have been fighting for her many of them opted out to fight for racial injustice this summer instead of being in the bubble and so yeah the women have been doing this for years with little recognition and Quite frankly, I don't think they care. They know what's right, and they know that they should be doing this, that they have this platform, and they're going to do it. But that doesn't make it right that they don't receive the recognition that they should. The NBA, I mean, they've done some great things also, but they've kind of done it on the heels of the WNBA and recognizing, okay, they've made these choices, so I guess we should probably do the same. How much does support from their male co-parts play in them getting the respect they deserve. I know when he was alive, Kobe Bryant was a big component of the WNBA and women's sports because he has all daughters. So how much do big star names like that play in getting them the respect they deserve? This is tough. I think 
you know, the Kobe Bryant's, LeBron James's of the world, I think that does help. But then you see them promoting it and you see the trolls coming in and, and saying the same thing. Nobody cares about women's sports. You're just saying this to say this, like you would never support them anyway. So it's kind of a catch-22 because, yeah, like Kobe, I think 100% supported women's basketball because of his daughters. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the things that happened in his past as well probably ca was a catalyst for that as well. And I, I just, I don't know how to really think about whether those men in those positions really would change people's perspective. I think there are people out there that just think women's sports don't matter, are stupid, are whatever word you want to use to describe them, and will, you'll never be able to change their perspective. But I think that there are some people out there that just don't know how great women's sports are. And so if we have those men out there that will, are willing to support the orange hoodies for the the WNBA bubble, those sold out pretty rapidly. And a lot of the NBA players had them and wore them prior to games and things like that. So if they can do little things like that, I think that helps. I think that helps with the exposure. But whether they're truly going to be able to ex to change people's minds, I, I don't think so. But I think they can maybe garner some more support by by being a part of that. Now. That, to me, doesn't mean that they're going to be able to find a way to get them more funding or, you know, more money to pay them, anything like that, unless they kind of ante up that. And I don't don't believe that they would do that on their own. So if you, let's say, were the C CEO of like ESPN or like on the board of trustees or things of that, and you had real power to make change for women in sports, what would five steps you would take to try and promote them, get them equal pay? What would you do? Ooh, that's a tough question. Number one, I think sponsors. You've got to have people that are willing to sponsor these women's sports. Ooh, with the NWSL, lots of acronyms here. Um, the NWSL, Budweiser, Secret, some of these big name companies came in and said, hey, we're going to sponsor the NWSL. And that's huge. Having those names, having those um, companies say we support women's sports, that's massive. And, and that's a good way to bring in revenue. Another step I think that should be taken would be you've got to give women a chance. At the end of the day, if you're going to sit there and say, well, nobody's going to watch, so we're not going to put it on, you have no way of knowing that nobody's going to watch. And sure, there's probably going to be times where a women's sport competing with maybe the NFL or something, the, the numbers are probably going to be lower than the NFL. That It is what it is. And that's true of, you know, the world we live in anyway. Like, you know, the NFL ratings might go down because there's the NBA finals on, things like that. There's always competing things. But if you never give women the chance to even compete in, in the ratings world, then you're never going to have any data to say, hey, yeah, this is working. People are watching. So giving women a chance, I think, is another step that, that needs to occur. Another step, this is so hard, five steps. Would you combine CBAs? For the for soccer, yeah, I think I think they need to go back to the drawing board. And I don't know how different the NBA, WNBA, what those look like. But for soccer, I think absolutely they need to go back to the negotiation, which the men's CBA is, I think, running out this year or next year. And so they're going to have to go back and negotiate. And I think the they've... Um, kind of are riding the women's coattails because they're hoping that by the women renegotiating their CBA, that means that they're going to be better off. Mm -hmm. And so that's also a problem, but they should have the same CBAs. But it, you know, you win, you get paid, you lose, you don't. However they structure the pay, it should be exactly the same. The benefits should be the same. Now, I will argue that women should have some additional benefits in terms of like maternity leave, things like that. Not saying that men shouldn't have paternity leave, but there there are some additional things that, you know, women need in terms of protection when having kids and things like that. 
So yeah, I mean, the CBA should 100% be the same or equitable in some way. It's so hard to really think about what other things you can do. It really comes down to, I think, just giving them the opportunity, being willing to take a chance and and supporting that choice. So, you know, if something flops, not backing away from it and not taking responsibility for that. And then just just marketing to people. You You can't expect people to watch something they know nothing about. So showing one advertisement that the women's national team are playing on a Tuesday night, that's not going to cut it. If you want people to watch, you've got to be marketing that consistently. You've got to build some kind of desire to watch it. We see this all the time with the with ESPN and, and a Thursday night Mac game. Mm-hmm. Who wants to watch the Mac? I mean, I'm a Ball State grad. I... You know, I watch Ball State games occasionally, but nobody wants to watch the Mac, Mm -hmm. truthfully. But ESPN does a really good job of talking those games up, promoting them, and people watch them on a Thursday night. So why don't we do that with women's sports? I think with that, too, I think that if the women U.S. soccer team wasn't good, they would not be getting promoted as well, they barely get promoted now, but talked about because I think with women you have I don't know it's bad that it's like this, but you have to be so good that they have to make time to promote you and put you in between mediocre Mac games or just this past Thursday night football. It was the Jets and Denver, which both teams are terrible, but it was promoted heavily going in, and they had all the stuff. So those are things. I think also getting a woman who played sports, who went through it on like an advisory board or a high ranking position on ESPN or Fox would be a great step forward. Also with the pay gap, obviously with the CBAs and uh, even if you want to be bold like that, taking it to Congress, but then you have to worry about those type of things. And I do agree that they need more on their stuff, obviously with, having children, maternity leave, things like that. You can't control that. So they need that extra health insurance that a man would need. And obviously, elections and stuff sometimes affect them more than it does their male counterpart because of what Kennedy believes in, like, pre-existing conditions, how that can affect your season, things like that. I think those are the type of steps that need to be taken. And then the biggest thing is just getting the machine ESPN, Fox, CBS, NBC, ABC. Just get them on board. Like, really start promoting women. Don't wait and just make a Ronda Rousey. And then when she leaves, then there's no one talked about all the time. So just promoting all these great women and finding the time. We don't have to hear about the same things from the men every two seconds when there's new stories of greatness that women in sports are achieving. Chelsea, do you have anything else you want to say to the listeners at home before we sign out? Yeah, I just want to say that, I mean, I think women's sports has a presence that just needs to be exploited. And, and I, as a woman, have experienced sport and what it's done in my life. And I just want people to be able to experience that, too. We talk about sport being an escape for people. And, and why can't women's sport be an escape for people and and people have just been so hesitant to really buy into women's sports and I just wish that that would change because I wouldn't be in the position I am right now or wouldn't have the love for sport that I do if it weren't for some of the role models that I saw particularly with the 99ers and and Mia Hamm and and some of those other people And, and it's not until I started studying sport that I recognized how much women before me had to endure for me to even have the opportunities that I did in high school and and things like that because women weren't allowed to play sports at one point. It was not anything they did and when they were allowed to it were sports like you know tennis and non-contact sports like dancing and things like that and not that those are bad but I just would not have been given the opportunity to play soccer and find my love for soccer without the trailblazers before me. So 
just want to thank them and and you know thank them for their sacrifice and what they had to go through for me to be able to have this opportunity and for me to be able to work in sport and and see women in these positions of being analysts and being on professional calls things like that and and officials and whatever it is representation matters and and you need to see yourself in those positions to believe that you can hold them well said well said well thank you everyone for listening to this episode of the l7c podcast thank you chelsea for being our esteemed guest today we hope to have you on for future episodes you know if your schedule allows it hopefully down the road we can get you back on again and once again thank you all for listening thank you for the support you've been showing us it's been amazing we hope you have a wonderful day and take care thank you for listening to this episode of the l7c podcast be sure to like rate review and subscribe to the channel follow us on all social media platforms and we'll be talking to you guys soon take care